Welcome to Light Over Heat with Professor David Yamani. This week I want to talk about an editorial that ran in the New York Times recently called Firearms Classes Taught Me and America a Very Dangerous Lesson. When this editorial began circulating on Twitter, I got a lot of people writing to me asking if I knew the author Harel Shapira because he's also a sociologist who's studying defensive gun culture. In fact, I do know Harel. I've known him for a number of years since he began this project studying defensive gun schools. I had him as a guest speaker in my sociology of guns class and a guest lecturer on campus at Wake Forest University back in 2016. I've contributed a chapter to a book on gun studies that he has co-edited. And I think he is a serious scholar for people who asked if he was basically lying or being disingenuous. I think he's not. I think that the key to understanding his work is that what he's describing is a partial reality but he's not describing the full reality of defensive gun culture or what I call gun culture 2.0. And so when he draws dire implications from his study for American democracy, I think he's over generalizing. But let me get into some of the details of his piece. So Shapira writes, the classes I attended train students to believe their lives are in constant danger. They prepared us to shoot without hesitation and avoid legal consequences. They instilled the kind of fear that has a corrosive effect on all interactions and beyond that, on the fabric of our democracy. And so Shapira's work here really draws on and plays into what I am starting to call the master narrative of guns destroying democracy. And so whether he's accurate in his description and uh, drawing appropriate conclusions really matters for whether democracy is actually being imperiled or not. And so what I think, again, is that he is drawing a partial truth, but he's over drawing his conclusions based on that. He studied 42 classes. He interviewed 52 instructors and 118 students in, from what I can tell, four states, Texas, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Illinois. Uh, but he says in particular that he immersed himself in firearm schools in Texas. Uh, so again, this is his empirical database. It's actually you know, appropriate to what sociologists typically do, given the intensity of this sort of work. It isn't as broad a data set, I would say, as what I draw upon in my work. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm right and he's wrong. Again, interpretive social science is a limited endeavor. Sociology itself is a probabilistic science. And so this interpretive and probabilistic nature seems to get left behind when he draws dramatic conclusions like this uh, phenomenon is corrosive to the fabric of our very democracy. Now, there are, I think, some contradictory moments in this essay. For example, he says that the classes he attended prepared students to shoot without hesitation and to avoid legal consequences. And that doesn't seem to be actually the case, right? Because he says later, that the primary lessons are about if and when to shoot someone on purpose, right? And so in none of the classes that I have observed over 10 years, uh, does anybody say that they should shoot people without hesitation and without regard to the legal consequences? And in fact, later on in his essay, Shapira acknowledges that, quote unquote, officially, the message is caution, right? And so what does that mean? That means this is what's actually being taught, but he thinks that other things being said in the course are a sort of hidden curriculum uh, that is what the instructors really mean to teach. And again, I would dispute this 
based on my own observations. I don't think that there is a subtext to what the classes I've observed say. The people who teach these classes say clearly that absolutely you may have to shoot somebody in self-defense. And if you're not comfortable with that, then you shouldn't be in the class. And I've actually seen in concealed carry classes that people have either left in the middle of the class or they have decided not to get their concealed carry permit precisely because they didn't accept the fact that they might have to shoot another person. And that's appropriate. But again, it highlights the fact that those instructors are actually advising students appropriately that this is not about scaring people. It's not about brandishing your weapon, that the law of self-defense permits someone to use lethal force in self-defense under certain conditions. And it's not about escaping legal responsibility, as Shapira uh, suggests. It's about doing uh, this within what the law allows, right? Uh, if you are driving your car within the boundaries of the law, it's not like you're escaping legal responsibility for doing something wrong. You are following the law. And here, I really think that uh, a lot of sociologists sort of tip their hand that they really don't think that there's any circumstances under which somebody should be using lethal force in self-defense. Uh, now, I can't prove that, but I think that that is an underlying motivation one of the reasons I say this is because of the way in his essay, Shapira turns from his observations of the classes to how he is feeling himself, right? He says, officially, the message is caution, but relentlessly harping on the dangers that surround us changes the way students assess risk. And crucially, he says, I experienced it myself. Now, I have also been in many, many classes in which people stressed, these are actual dangers that you may confront in life. These are the probabilities. He also notes that a common way of framing this is that it's not the odds of something happening to you, it's the stakes. But in saying that, it's actually saying the odds are fairly low of your having to confront this sort of situation, which doesn't exactly trigger irrational fear. And I myself never had the feelings that Shapira experienced as a consequence of the classes he took. And I think that probably says something very much about the differences between his personality distribution, uh, disposition and cultural uh, risk tolerance versus mine. It's absolutely the case that we at times see people using lethal force in what seems to be inappropriate ways. I've spoken recently about the case in Kansas City of the uh, teenager getting shot on a person's porch, uh, the case in upstate New York of someone shooting someone in their driveway, right? But we have to consider whether these are anomalies or exceptions that prove the rule because there are 19 or 20 or even 21 million people who have licenses to carry concealed weapons in public and millions of others more who uh, can carry in public uh, in permitless carry states. And there are many people who have firearms for self-defense. And if Shapiro was right that these training classes simply encourage people uh, to shoot first and ask questions later, basically is what he's saying, then we'd see a lot more of these incidents than we actually do. So Shapira concludes his essay by talking about not just uh, gun violence per se, but he says another less recognized casualty is the kind of public interactions that make democracy viable. He's saying that all of this excessive fear, all of this avoidance that it creates ruins the kinds of public interactions that make democracy possible. But again, I don't see the people that I have trained with, that I've observed training, refraining from interacting with people uh, in public. Um, obviously, some of them do. Again, Shapira is capturing some aspect of reality here. But is that really any different than uh, my mother who doesn't want to answer her door for a stranger 
even though she's not a gun person, she's never taken any gun training classes, right? Is the erosion of public interaction in American society really due to the fact that people are taking these gun training classes? I think not. And because I think not, I also then challenge his conclusion that gun training courses is training people not to be citizens, right? And this is a serious charge. Uh, it's certainly a charge that sells. It sells to the New York Times opinion editors. It sells to the readers who voraciously consume this opinion. And it's sold to a publisher who paid a hefty advance to publish Shapira's book based on this research. And I say this uh, fully admitting the fact that I am frustrated that I cannot pose uh, my own book as a counter to Shapira's account because over 30 publishers have not only not been willing to pay me in advance for my book, they haven't even been willing to take my book. I had hoped that my book would appear alongside Shapira's uh, as a point of contrast. That may still happen, but the fact that his book was so eagerly uh, adopted and for such a large advance really suggests how powerful this master narrative of guns destroying democracy actually is.